achievable uh, through nginx open source now what's the purpose of this presentation in talking about nginx as an api gateway well a uh, couple of numbers most websites use nginx yes that is true uh, actually the vast majority of the top 10,000 websites in the world are using uh, nginx plus uh, it's the presentation zoomed in says chat yes it kind of looks that way it doesn't look that way let me try another way of sharing this i'll try this as uh, uh your entire screen try uh, boom. How does that work? And if I now shut down my webcam, does that look better to people or uh, how do we like it? Better. Okay, cool. So you now see one screen with a uh, number one and most websites use Nginx and that's covering the full screen, is it? Feedback from chat. I know it'll happen. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jamil. Um, so Yes, most websites use Nginx. We, we know that. Uh, what perhaps was a little bit surprising to us was uh, we perform user surveys every year, both between the community users as well as the, the uh, commercial customers. Uh, we actually just had our uh, current one out, uh, so we'll see the results of that in the, in the next few weeks, I imagine. But what we found was that roughly 40% of all Nginx deployments are in fact used as an API gateway. Now, that was slightly surprising to us. Uh, maybe it shouldn't have been, but it, it was because uh, from the get-go, when you look at the hi history of Nginx, it wasn't initially designed specifically for the API gateway purpose. Maybe it shouldn't have been so surprising, though, when we consider the fact that, uh, well, what is an API gateway? An API gateway is a reverse proxying load balancer with uh, uh, with a number of features associated with it, some authentication and authorization and access control, stuff like that, rate limiting, connection limiting, some of that good stuff. Uh, and, and when you start looking at the checklist of what an API gateway needs to, to have, you'll find that Nginx takes each and every book. So it shouldn't really have been that uh, surprising. I suppose the reason it was a little surprising is that um, in order to deploy Nginx uh, open source as an API gateway, uh, you would need to know a thing or two about Nginx and, uh, and you know, keep your wits about you. Uh, but that's fine. The benefit you get from going that route is that you get one of the most rock solid and ultra performant API gateways uh, available. And when you start looking at how to configure it, it's not all that complicated at all. So that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, and let's workshop. Let's indeed. Now, what we're going to build looks a little bit like this. Uh, so this is a pretty standard, uh, simple setup. You have an API client communicated or communicating over one to an API gateway, who in turn communicates to one or more backend APIs and typically load balancing and hopefully also applying some policies and, and uh, control there as well. So that's what we are going to build. Now, in reality, this is what we're going to build. So we're, we're going to com combine a couple of factors. Uh, technically speaking, there's very little difference between uh, what we were looking to build and what we're actually going to build. Uh, it's just that we're putting several roles on one in the same machine. It makes it easier for workshop purposes. There's no nefarious reason for it, really. So. Uh, you guys can actually follow along if you want to. Now, this is going to be pretty, uh, pretty fast tempo, uh, but it is fully possible to follow along uh, if you have a laptop with an internet connection and you either have uh, access to a Linux host or a virtual machine, uh, or if you have Docker installed. I'm uh, actually going to utilize Docker myself for this, and, uh, and we're going to deploy it. Uh, so uh, you need to install Nginx, of course. Um, the simplest way of verifying if Nginx is installed correctly is to run Nginx-V, which would output version information. So um, we have installation guides for how to install Nginx. And uh, of course, for anything open source, nginx.org would be your main go-to uh, domain. Uh, we obviously also has in, uh, have nginx.com, uh, but that's more about the uh, uh, 
the commercial product set and that side of things. Although you will find a fair amount of Nginx unit information on uh, on Nginx.com as well, even though that's purely open source. Uh, we do provide uh, installable binaries for all the usual suspects of Linux distributions. Uh, so Red Hat, CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu, uh, even all the way down to Alpine, which is really, really cool once you start talking about microservices and containerized situations. Uh, I have an Nginx Plus image, which is the commercial uh, uh, product, which effectively is Nginx open source plus a number of additional features and functionality. So it would be larger in terms of binary than Nginx open source is. Uh, I have a Docker container with Nginx Plus with all the bells and whistles running on Alpine, and the Docker image is less than 20 megabytes. So that's really, really cool. Uh, moving along, uh, installing Nginx is incredibly simple. Uh, now, depending on your, uh, your distribution, you'd want to use YUM or apt or, uh, or, in the case of Alpine, APK. Uh, you can also directly Docker pull ready-made images. Uh, it's super, super simple. Uh, now, one note though, when you install uh, Nginx directly just by using yum install, uh, apt install, or apk add, uh, you would be utilizing the repository for the Linux distribution in question. Now, Nginx obviously being as popular as it is, all of them maintain a copy of Nginx, but that could typically be lagging a little bit in terms of versions. So uh, I, I would recommend that you look at, uh, at adding our repository and deploying it directly from there. But hey, to each their own. Now, what we're going to be doing is creating an API gateway. I'm, in fact, running this on Docker. So I'm using the, uh, the command at the bottom of the screen right now to run my container. Uh, it's really, really uh, simple to set up. It will do everything for you. Now, by adding the volume, the dash V here, uh, and mounting a volume from the Docker host into the container, uh, specifically into slash etc slash nginx slash conf dot D, uh, I'm effectively taking control over the configuration directory uh, that nginx uses by default from the Docker host, which makes things a lot easier in terms of uh, in terms of editing configurations and stuff like that. Now, we're not going to be doing a whole lot of config edits today. So could you do it using VI or Nano or whatever in, inside of the Docker container? Of course you could, not a problem at all. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be doing that myself with the slight caveat that my Docker host is, is in fact running on a Windows machine. So to keep it slightly Linux-y, I got Nano running on my Windows machine. So forgive me. Um, anyways, moving along, um, what we're looking at here is the default uh, etc nginx nginx.com. That's the main nginx configuration file, and this is uh, equally true for nginx open source as it would be for nginx plus, for that matter. Uh, now, if we have a quick look in my terminal, uh, can I first verify with you guys, is this text size readable, or should I increase the, uh, the text size in the terminal? Uh, this is a good size because it allows my my default tables and stuff to display. But if we need to increase it, we can. Let's see if chat catches up with us. If it's silence, I'm going to assume it's OK. If you have any problems, just cry out. Anyways, so I have cheated a little bit. Uh, and when I say I've cheated a little bit, I mean a little bit. I have uh, all I've done is I've ran this particular uh, uh, container. Now, the configuration directory is empty. Uh, so if I have a look at the current uh, status of the uh, host directory that I mounted as a volume into the Docker container, uh, it is, in fact, empty. It's just containing a subdirectory, uh, and that, in turn, is also empty. So we have nothing here. What does that mean in, uh, in reality? It means the Docker container that we are uh, dealing with will also be empty. So if I do something uh, fun like uh, curling local host and learn how to type as well uh, on port 8080, which is what I'm exposing here, uh, I should be getting that exactly. Because Nginx has no configuration to operate with, so it's not going to start listening on any ports or anything of that nature. It's installed, but it's not running, running, uh, if that makes any sense at all. 
Now we're going to fix that problem as we move along throughout this presentation. Problem, it's by, de by design, it's working exactly as it's supposed to do. So, uh, moving along in the presentation, I am now going to be defining an API gateway. So what am I going to be defining exactly? I'm going to be defining a, uh, a server block listening on a port. And uh, I'm going to add an include statement. Uh, those of you familiar with Nginx config would, be, uh, would likely be familiar with its uh, inclusion of include to be a bit recursive. Um, Having the ability to use include statements in the configuration is incredibly powerful. And if we go, go back a couple of slides, uh, let's see here. So this fella, the main Nginx configuration, the entry point into the Nginx configuration is uh, nginx.conf residing in slash etc slash Nginx. And it has one very vital uh, statement here on line 24 include slash etc slash nginx slash conf.d slash asterisk.com meaning at that particular line it will substitute its line with the contents of any file ending in dot conf residing in the conf.d subdirectory you can have however many include statements you want in your total configuration you can also have nested include so you can have an include statement within a file that gets included by an include statement uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and when I'm talking about your total configuration, that's the configuration as the binary sees it rather than how it uh, looks in the file system. Uh, and here's a pro tip for you. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, Nginx has a feature for testing configuration uh, to see if the syntax is okay and everything is good. And that's Nginx dash lowercase t for test. Uh, if you use uppercase t, instead of lowercase, so nginx dash uppercase t, it will output to the prompt the configuration as it exists in memory, as nginx, uh, the binaries, sees it. And that, of course, can be uh, piped to file and so on and so forth. Actually, that's typically how support would start their conversation by having a look at configuration. So if you want to know exactly what nginx sees in terms of your configuration, nginx dash uppercase t is your friend. Moving along, uh, so we're going to define this server of ours. Uh, now, I was a little bit short on time before this. Hopefully, I had time to actually make this copyable, and I think I did, yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over to the terminal. Uh, we see that this file is called api underscore gateway.conf. So that's the file that we're looking to create directly in the conf.d directory. So that's our job right now. Let's do that first and foremost. Uh, and I know that uh, this uh, folder, so my D Docker share F1 API slash configs is being uh, mapped in as a volume directly to the uh, conf.d directory. So um, even though I'm on the host, this will be automatically uh, synchronized into the container as well. So we're good there. Let's uh, go ahead. I'm going to use an old friend of mine, little old Nano. Don't laugh. It's good enough for the purposes that we need it for right now. Uh, so learning how to type again, gateway.com. So that's api underscore gateway.conf. That's exactly what we want to do. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to be lazy and paste in this, uh, this fella. So uh, looking at the presentation again, it's the same uh, text. All I've done is I've omitted the com uh, comments. So that's all. Uh, that's how that's looking. Now, that's all we're going to do for that fella. Uh, we're good with that. So I'm going to just exit out of Nano and save this fella. And that's all good. Now, we have created the file, uh, and uh, if I go and have a look inside of the container, so say, um, what did I call it? API gateway, API GW uh, bash, and I am now in. OK, so I'm going to go into etc, nginx, conf.d. I should see uh, a folder called my APIs and a file called apigateway.com. And just to be really sure, uh, I'm just going to output that. And indeed, it is the same as we're looking at. So I'm just going to exit out of the container. I just wanted to prove that it's actually there. 
uh, and uh, I'm now back in my host. Now, what happens now if I do something as cool as curl local host on port 80, uh, 8080? I am still getting an empty reply. Now, why is, why is this? We now have a configuration. Yes, we do have a configuration, but we have not, uh, in fact, um, uh, reloaded the configuration. So being on the host, what's the most effective way of doing that? Well, typically, well, all literature would tell you that you should do an nginx-t to test the config before doing an nginx um, reload or config reload. And that is true. However, if you're lazy like me and for the example of this workshop, uh, I am simply going to do so docker exec on the API gateway. I'm going to run nginx. Actually, let's not forget our flags. Uh, so on the API gateway, I'm going to run nginx dash s reload. So why am I jumping directly to sending the signal of reload to the process instead of doing the test first? Well, the reason for that is the reload is actually doing the test implicitly before attempting to reload the configuration. So if there's anything wrong, I would not be able to do this. Hopefully there isn't anything wrong. Let's have a look, see. There isn't anything wrong. And then I get that feedback. The problem with doing this is if there is anything wrong, I'm not getting the output from the nginx-t. But my approach is I'll rather do this and be right and uh, not having to do multiple lines for reloading the config uh, 99 out of 100 times. And the 100th time where the signal process doesn't restart, I'll rather do the dash t then to figure out what's going on. So yeah, uh, being lazy. Lazy is good. So now we've restarted the, uh, the process. So how, what happens now if we curl this fella? Yay! We are, in fact, uh, now receiving a response. And it's pretty close to what I predicted in the presentation. It's actually exactly what I predicted in the presentation, with the exception that when this presentation was made, I was on a version or two behind. Never mind that. Uh, life moves on, and so on and so forth. But what's the problem with this? Well, the problem with this, uh, looking like it does in the presentation, is wait. The API gateway looks like a web server. What, what's going on here? I'm, I'm, I need my API gateway to behave like an API gateway and provide error responses the way it's supposed to be in JSON, in pretty, pretty JSON, rather than just a simple HTTP 400. So what we need to do for that is to define the JSON error response. Luckily, that's very, very simple. So we're going to go ahead and include some additional configuration here. So what we're including here is error responses. Uh, we're going to keep uh, the, uh, the majority of uh, the rest of the config, and we're simply going to include the error responses bit. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's see here. We're going to go back to the terminal. Again, verifying we're in conf.de, API gateway.conf. It's the same file. Nothing changes there. So I'm simply going to add this block here below the location slash uh, element of it. Let's go ahead and have fun with that. So uh, I have my API gateway there. Uh, so that fella. And I'm simply going to go below the location block here. I'm going to add my stuff here. And that's my error responses. So what I'm doing now is I'm defining, uh, uh, first I'm setting a parameter where the default type being returned is application JSON. And that's fine for an API gateway. Uh, absolutely fine. That's what's being expected. And if there is any change to that in any specific location or specific response, then we can alter it for that response specifically. Uh, and for the rest of it, just assume that everything is application slash JSON. Very good. Uh, we're also defining that uh, error page for the error 400 should uh, go to the location at 400, which is a named location in Nginx terms. Uh, a location starting with that is what's called a named location. And then we define the location at 400, and we say in that it should return an HTTP status code of 400, but the body should instead be a JSON object containing status 400 and message as bad request. Brilliant. Does that work, we wonder? Let's find out. I'm going to save this file, and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, reload the configuration again. Boom, everything's good. What happens now if we curl our fella and see? 
Yay, we now have an API gateway. So effectively, what have we done so far? Uh, well, we've uh, gone ahead and uh, created a specific error for the HTTP 400 and have that returned in JSON format. Now, if I go ahead and try, uh, I'm actually not entirely sure this is going to work, but let's give it a go. We can't be more than wrong. Uh, um, oh, yes, 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 indeed, of course. But you know, the configuration we have running in Nginx right now simply has one location, and that's location forward slash, which is a prefix matching. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit more momentarily. So it'll match anything. So I'm only ever going to get uh, 400 requests at the moment. But we're going to fix that. Now, we had to add uh, one, two, three, four, five lines into the configuration. Uh, in order to define one error. There are many, many errors. That seems like an awful lot of work. Uh, I, I don't want to go ahead and define each and every error in JSON format. Well, luckily for you guys, we have done that for you. So all you would have to do is to, uh, to uh, download a configuration file I've prepared for you guys. Uh, and um, uh, the URL you can find it at is this one here. That URL is only going to be available for the duration of this uh, uh, the API days. But I have a URL where these files and everything else surrounding this workshop exists permanently. And I'll share that in the final slides of this uh, presentation. So uh, if I go ahead and I copy out that command, we can have a look at what is that file in reality. Uh, let's have a look-see. So I'm going to go back to the terminal. Uh, I'm just going to clear to have a little bit of soap. Uh, the command in question looks like this, but instead of storing it as a file, I'll just output it to the terminal, and you can see how it looks. So that's how it looks. It simply defines uh, error pages for all of the standard JSON uh, uh, JSON based errors, or sorry, I should say API based errors, uh, and creates locations for that. And since we've already learned about the power of include, that means that file can simply be included into your configuration and you can forget about it. It's perfect. It's brilliant. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's have a look-see here. Uh, we're, we're going to uh, get that file into the My APIs folder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that command and actually download the file rather than output it to the terminal and put it into the My APIs uh, folder. So let's do that. Uh, first and foremost, I'm in the right folder, right? Yes. And I'm going to go, uh, no, sorry, I'm going to go into that fella. And it is currently empty. And then I'm going to do that. Now, use wget, use, use curl, uh, whichever your, your preference is. They do exactly the same thing in this particular constant, uh, context with a dash uh, uppercase O flag. So I'm going to do that. And uh, first off, let's see that we have a file. We do. And if I look into that file, it is, in fact, the file that we were hoping to get. So that's brilliant. Now, if you note the path here, it's in this folder, which of course equates to slash etc slash nginx slash conf.d in the container, but it is in a subdirectory a directory called my APIs. Now, if you remember from the nginx.conf, its global include statement was include asterix.conf from slash etc slash nginx slash conf.d. Uh, it does not include anything from the subdirectory. And that's exactly the purpose why I built, uh, why I made this subdirectory. I want files that's in that subdirectory to not be included by default. I would have to include them uh, specifically. And we are going to do exactly that. Now, if I do a reload at this stage, uh, given the fact that the uh, the uh, my API subdirectory is not part of the include statement, the config that Nginx sees hasn't changed at all. It's exactly the same as it was. So there's no big reason for us to do that, even though in the presentation I suggested you do. Instead, uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, boom, boom, boom. Oh, actually, that was the previous one. We're going to go ahead and uh, 
publish our first API. So this is roughly how it's going to look. Uh, we're going to be pointing it towards the backend API. I've spun up a backend API that's publicly available at the moment. Uh, this is not an API uh, or a collection of APIs. It's not of my authorship. Uh, it is uh, an open source API that's downloadable, and I'll provide the details at the end of the presentation. So what are we, in fact, doing here? Uh, we want to have uh, a URI looking roughly like this to find out information about a Formula One driver called Hamilton. So let's go ahead and publish that API. The routing is going to look a little bit like this. Uh, and that's, again, in theory, I've simplified things a little bit. Uh, we have URIs like API slash F1 uh, slash asterisk, API drivers asterisk, API circuit asterisk, and then equals uh, slash API uh, slash F1 slash seasons. And this is where we talk about the different matching types of locations in Nginx. We have three types. We have a prefix match, which the three first uh, here are examples of. We have an exact match, which the last one is an example of. Uh, and we have a regex match, which we will be looking at uh, briefly a little bit later in the presentation. So what's the difference? Well, a prefix match, which is when we do simply slash API slash F1, uh, will match anything starting with that string. Whatever comes after it, it will still be matched with it. So even though we're not including the slash asterisk in the location definition in the, the config, it will include effectively a pattern looking like that. Uh, when we add an equal, so it will be location equal slash API slash F1 slash seasons, it's an exact match. And it will only match a request looking exactly like that. Nothing more, nothing less. Finally, there's a regular expression match where we can use proper regular expressions to define how the location matching should look. Uh, that's a much bigger topic, and it deserves its own conversation. So we're going to gloss over it a little bit for today, but it's incredibly useful. So uh, in order to do this, we're going to define the backend servers. Now, I'm defining two upstreams here, an upstream called F1 admin, and I'm including an F1 data as well. Now, for the simplicity of my sanity and setting up these workshops and stuff, I've joined them. They're both using the same backends. But you could, of course, split them out into separate services, separate locations for that matter. And I'm talking geographical locations rather than locations blocked in config. Uh, you can do whatever you want. But for the simplicity of setting it up, I've simply joined all of the APIs, both on data and admin and everything on the same two servers. These are just two Docker containers running in the cloud, and uh, they will uh, be able to receive the responses. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go one uh, let's go ahead and uh, create those upstreams. Uh, if I'm really lucky, I've actually copied out that text and I can uh, go ahead and paste it directly into my terminal. I am looking here and I'm seeing that I'm, I want to still be in conf.d and I want to create a file called api underscore backends.conf. Brilliant. Let's go ahead and do that. So uh, I see here that I'm in the wrong directory. I need to get one level up to three, and now we're in the right place. So I'm going to go ahead and create uh, a file called api underscore backend.com. That's in orange juice. Uh, so there we go. And what I want to put in that content is this fella here. So I'm just creating two upstream groups or load balancing pools, whatever your uh, preferred vernacular is. And in them, I'm simply load balancing between two upends, happening to be the same ones in my particular instance here. So that's all well and good. I'm simply going to go ahead and save this backends file. Uh, and since I know that it is, in fact, residing in the conf.d directory in the container, it will automatically be picked up now by the include statement in the uh, nginx.com, the entry point configuration file. Uh, now, in order to actually utilize these uh, locations of ours, uh, the, sorry, these upstream groups of ours, we're going to have to uh, create some new configuration as well. So now we're going to create a file called f1.conf residing in the subdirectory we've prepared called my underscore APIs. What are we doing there? Well, first, we're uh, defining a prefix match of slash API slash F1 slash. And here's where it gets a little bit funky. I have a location matching criteria inside of location matching criteria. 
can you do that? Yes, of course I can. Uh, it is uh, one of the many uh, features of Nginx that uh, apparently not that many people are aware of. Why would you do this though? Is there any purpose to having this outside location uh, matching uh, criteria? Wouldn't these be matched fine if they were residing on their own outside of it? Yes, they would. But here's the benefit of nesting them like this. By nesting them like this, I can apply policy to this stub, to slash API slash F1 slash. I can apply a policy that will then be inherited into all of the locations existing within that outer location matching criteria. And we're gonna be doing that momentarily. Now, these are examples uh, of the three matching criteria. Here we have a prefix match saying just location slash API slash F1 slash drivers. So it will match anything that continues on to be slash Hamilton slash whatever, this, that, and the other. Uh, Next, we have a regex match indicated by the tilde. Uh, so this will also be a case sensitive regex matching. If we wanted a case insensitive one, we would have tilde asterisk and then this ring. What are we matching in the regex? Well, slash API slash F1 and then some numbers. Uh, so we're gonna have a look at a one or a two as the first digit. Uh, and then we're gonna have uh, one or more uh, zero through nine. So effectively, this mask is uh, a cheap and crude way of masking a year. We're, we're looking for a year here in the F1. Uh, and then finally, we have an exact match with the equal sign. So we're just going to look specifically for that string and nothing else. Uh, if we add a slash orange juice after here, that will not be picked up by this matching criteria. So moving along uh, hastily, because uh, time is at a premium. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to put that fella, the API configuration, into our um, uh, our configuration. So give me a second here. And I am going to do exactly that. I'm going to need to do this. I just need to copy a string out of my notes so you don't have to look at me fat fingering this brutally. Uh, that looks the same, that looks the same, yes, that looks all the same, so this is what I'm copying. Uh, then we're going to head over to our terminal, and we're going to do that. In my APIs, we're going to create f1.conf. Into the terminal we go. Uh, so verifying my directory, I need to go into my APIs, and I am now creating a file called f1.conf. Uh, how does that look? Well, as we were just discussing, it looks like this. So uh, if you notice, in some of these, we're going to proxy pass to F1 data. In some of them, we're going to proxy pass to F1 admin. Uh, we know from what we discussed earlier that this effectively points to the same place, but it didn't have to. We could have split it out however we wanted to. So I'm just going to save that file real quick. Uh, and. Let's see how our, uh, how we're going with our come on. Uh, let's see how our configuration is uh, in terms of uh, actually, let's do it the, the right way this time. So you get to see that again. Let's test our config. Config is fine so far. Excellent stuff. We have do, been doing great work here. So what's the next step at this fellow? Oh, yeah, uh, as the slide says, policies can apply at any level. And that's the beauty of it again. We can have a policy applied out here in location slash API slash F1 slash that will inherit into them. But we can also specify explicitly inside of the sub locations what policies we want to apply. And those may either be new policies or indeed overriding whatever policies we set globally outside here. So that's all cool. Uh, now, have we done everything we need to do? Let's see. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, boom, boom, boom. I'm going to go ahead and copy out a file. Uh, uh, sorry, a statement. Doom, doom. Copy. And we're going to have a look see. Uh, I think we may have skipped a step, but we'll know momentarily. It's hard to keep track of everything uh, when you're doing these things. but. Let's go ahead and do that. And we are trying for the URL API slash F1 slash universe slash Hamilton. Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look see. We didn't skip that step. Okay. I, I ac accidentally covered it and forgot that I did. 
Beautiful, we are exactly where we want to do. So now I'm, I am in fact returning uh, API data and I'm doing so uh, through the uh, API gateway that we're defining here, uh, that we have defined. Uh, now, right now, we're not applying any policies. We're just blindly routing this traffic to the backend endpoints. And the backend endpoints, of course, as we know, are also publicly accessible directly. Uh, so I would get the same data going directly to the backend endpoints. That's not how you would do it in a real world example, but for the simplicity of the workshop, that's how it's set up. However, we will be going through this fella uh, because we want to have the API gateway as a load balancer, but also to enforce policy and security and these things. So moving along, uh, back in the presentations, uh, what have we done so far? Well, we've uh, accomplished this. We are receiving data. Uh, you can beautify it with JQ, of course. So we have published our first API, but we do not have any policies applied. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to configure some simple rate limiting. And in the rate limiting, uh, we're doing this in the API gateway.conf as well as in the f1.conf. So in the API gateway.conf, uh, Sorry about that. Uh, in the API gateway.conf, we're defining a limit re uh, request zone. Uh, we're going to do the limitation based on remote address. There are other parameters you could use for this purpose. Uh, we're creating a zone. We're uh, allocating a megabyte for said zone to share the memory across worker processes. And we're defining a limit at a rate of two requests per second. So uh, that's in the API gateway.conf. I'm going to just type that out in the background for my file because I realized now I hadn't copied it. Uh, I hadn't made it copyable. So my apologies for that. Meanwhile, you guys can have a look at the f1.conf and see if you uh, get what it's actually doing there uh, in terms of the two extra commands that we have introduced. Uh, so give me a second. I'll type out the. So uh, we are doing dollar remote. Uh, yeah, and we're giving a zone name. It would be right B. And what size did we tell it? It was one megabyte, one megabyte, and the rate equals to R over seconds. Like so, did I type everything correct? Let me correct zone, uh, remote address, uh, zone per IP, one megabyte, and rate equals two. So, just to keep me honest, now that I'm done fat fingering this, that's exactly how it looks inside of my API gateway.com. So I'm going to save that out, uh, which would help if I actually did that in the terminal. I'm going to save that out like so, and that's done. Uh, the next part, of course, that we're going to do is uh, to do the, the um, limit request part of the F1 uh, bit. That, cleverly, I have made copyable, so I don't have to fat finger that. Beautiful. So we're going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to transition back. This is in the F1 conf in my APIs. Uh, so I'm going to go in there. Um, and we're going to add this at the very top of the location, as we already talked about. Uh, it's a matter of inheriting this into, uh, into the configuration directly. Uh, like so. Uh, we're going to save that out. Now, before I save that out, what we're doing here is we're saying that inside of this outer location, we're going to enforce a, a request limitation using the data in the definition we already made for the per IP zone and with no delay. Uh, we are going to return a status of 429 when requests are being limited. So let's save that out. We're going to do the reload of the configuration. Um, like so, boom, and we have in fact done a reload. Now, if I go ahead and I uh, curl something here, so yeah, Hamilton here, I'm still getting the data, and that's fine. But what happens if I do the request a number of times uh, really fast? What happened here? That wasn't entirely as I hoped it would be, or am I not seeing my 429s? Boom, boom, boom. 
did I not in fact save the configuration? Uh, cat the f one dot a uh, dot com. I have indeed uh, added the re limit reg uh, limitation, and in the gateway dot com. It's not a demo if nothing breaks. Uh, remote zone is per IP. It is two requests per second. Limit break zone, all of that is good. Let me just verify that I have in fact reloaded. So the process is started uh, and this is being caught by, ah, <laughs> of course. So now if I do that, it should in fact, uh, F why is it not doing that? I thought for a second I was going uh, bypassing the gateway, but I was not. And this was working 30, sec uh, 30 minutes ago, but not now. Sadly, I actually don't have time to troubleshoot this if we're gonna get a, uh, get through the next bit. Uh, just trust me when I say if I had did this correctly, you would be seeing 429s at this point. Embarrassing, but we need an error in a demo or we don't know that it's live. So yeah, moving along quickly. Uh, so here we go. Uh, actually, yes, I do know why that happened. So let's uh, let's go back here to our fella here, and we are going to go to. Actually, that's also wrong because I am now querying the backends directly. What I wanted to do was go through my local host 8080 because that's where the container for the gateway resides. So yes, we're doing that. And now if I do okay, run this five times, yay, success, score, we have results. Bravo. Well, I managed to re have some shot at redemption there. Let's move along quickly and forget that ever happened. Uh, so now we have published an API with rate limiting. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, authentication. Uh, and that will pretty much be the final thing we're going to do uh, looking at the time. So what we want to do here is we're go just going to do a simple example of basic authentication. Uh, we're going to include some basic authentication through an auth file. And this file is also available in the files. If you want to download it directly, it'll also be available from the GitHub repository. I'm going to give you the link to at the end of this. So let's just quickly and briefly go in and edit the myapis.f1.conf to add the basic authentication bit here. Uh, going into uh, here, I'm going to uh, edit the f1.conf. And before the rec limiting, I'm going to be putting in place our uh, basic authentication using a readily made HT password file. So I'm going to save that. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to execute the reload. Uh, that's fine. And now if we do in fact ask for, uh, say the same thing, the driver Hamilton, and I'm very fine now, I'm going through localhost, so I'm going through the actual API gateway. Now, indeed, we are getting a 401. Notice that we are also getting it in JSON because we already defined, right? That's all well and good. So how do we now access things in this, uh, this particular uh, API, so far, uh, API of ours? Well, now you have to define a user. Uh, and authorize the request. So what I can do is I can go ahead and uh, throw in, this is just, you know, basic authentication. So it's basically uh, for encoded and everything. It's nothing spectacularly difficult there. Uh, if I go ahead and add exactly the same URL for uh, transparency, transparency, we are uh, going to see uh, but, Oh, forbidden, that's not cool at all. Why are we not seeing that? Uh, we should be seeing, uh, doom, doom, doom. Uh, we should be seeing, is this, is this, this may be, since I'm doing a window system here, this may be some, um, uh, what it could be is indeed uh, some uppercase, lowercase stuff, uh, but, 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 but. Uh, so where did we put that? We we did set, just to look back through what we were actually doing, uh, we did set the uh, authentication for the outer location, which I think is what I did anyways. Uh, so let me just verify. Uh, that is exactly what I did. And I am indeed including the file and I should have gotten a, a 
error response if I didn't. So that's all good. Okay, so let's make this the one error that we got. Uh, what I'm guessing is the actual error here without me having time to troubleshoot it is since I'm going through a Windows uh, client with copy and paste and things, I think some things have been uh, converted, uppercase, lowercase, and stuff like that in terms of the client string. So we're going to just uh, speedily move past that the way it should look in a working scenario is when you do a normal request like so, uh, you would get the 401 unauthorized. Uh, well, I actually did get the 403 forbidden, which means the authentication actually worked. There's another reason for this failing. If we have a quick look at the terminal, you'll see that my error is indeed 403 forbidden. Anyways, uh, moving back, uh, having the correct uh, uh, authentication in place, then you would get the data the same way that we used to do. And if you did this correctly, rather than break it the way I did, you would be seeing exactly these results. Uh, this is just a quick example. We can, of course, do uh, API key uh, authentication as well. There are several different methods of which we can uh, authenticate or authorize requests, even in Nginx open source. In Nginx Plus, we go even further, and we can do OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect and so, and so on and so forth and all those good things. So we have now published an API with rate limiting uh, policy as well as, well, kind of authentication. Uh, so what we could do then is uh, to do uh, HTTP method matching. Now, we're not going to do that in the interest of time, but I'm just going to show you what you can do uh, in the configuration to have that API gateway functionality as well. You can put in limit accept uh, and add a list, one or more uh, HTTP verbs or methods, and then choose what to do with it. In this particular case, deny all. So in this particular case, a get request would go through, a post request would go through, but any other request would be denied and be uh, served with the appropriate uh, JSON error message and HTTP status code. So yeah, we're going to skip that for in the interest of time. So uh, well, if we had done that, we would also have been adding HTTP uh, method matching. So this is what we've done today, uh, more or less. We've introduced Nginx. We've created an API gateway. Uh, we've uh, done the the workshop element and with some uh, in air quotes hands on use cases we've done error handling api definition rate limiting authentication and http methods and as i'm sure you'll agree those are the basic building blocks of what you need in an api gateway so the purpose of this uh, this workshop was to show you that you can do all of this and it's relatively simple uh, you have all the tools at your disposal at your fingertips so when is it appropriate to go this route well, if all you want is a simple but incredibly fast and rook solid API gateway, then this is exactly what you should be doing. Uh, as enterprises start progressing into multiple API gateways and uh, not one or two, but tens or hundreds or even thousands of APIs that they need to deal with, with different authentication and so on and so forth, that's when you start moving into things like control planes and API management um, and those elements. But if you, what you want is a simple API gateway, what we did today gives you exactly that. So um, official Nginx open source downloads available at said link. Uh, Nginx Plus trials available at said link. And the configuration snippets used today, as well as a few others, is available at the following uh, gist. So that's gist.github.com forward slash uh, L Crilly. That's short, short for Liam Crilly, which is our uh, product manager for, uh, for this and overall genius. So he's the author of uh, most of the things that we were doing today, with the exception of the API itself, which is in fact uh yeah 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 uh, this is just digressing we have an uh, a book version of this workshop so you can go through it at your own pace downloadable from our website this is the api we were using the ergust api available at ergust.com uh, also at github and uh, just search, search for ergust api and you'll find it and that is uh, I don't know what the process is now. I see we've run slightly over, and I don't know if we're doing any questions or anything of that sort, but um, that was the workshop as it stands.
see there's a couple of things coming in. When it comes to uh, sessions recording, I don't know how that's going to work. I do know that they will be replayed twice for other time zones tomorrow. Uh, when it comes to the actual recordings, I don't know how that's going to fly. Uh, reach out to the organizers and they will be able to tell you that. Uh, Joseph, th thanks. Well, thank you. I hope there was value in this for you guys. Uh, and if, uh, if you guys have any further questions about anything Nginx, I urge you to take uh, Take contact, reach out. Uh, we have offices all around the world and we'll be happy to talk to you. Thanks so much, people. I'm going to bow out then and uh, let the next person take the, uh, take the floor. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time.